will be now read a second time, and I call the honourable member for Fremantle. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'm very happy to speak in support of the bills which implement Australia's commitments under the Australia-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement and under the Australia-United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement. Uh, the free trade agreements with India and the United Kingdom are in their own ways of very substantial value to Australia. They're built, built upon the depth and quality of the relationship between Australia and India and between Australia and the United Kingdom. And those relationships include considerable person-to-person -person links, they include complementary trade and investment interests, uh, an important shared history of international engagement and cooperation, and a shared commitment to dealing with a range of strategic, economic and environmental challenges, none of which can be handled without concerted and collaborative effort. Uh, Deputy Speaker, the suite of legislation we debate here today forms a key requirement for the timely ratification of these agreements, which the Albanese Labor government is absolutely uh, focused on delivering. It's a further instalment of Australia's consistent performance as an active and reliable trading partner. And I'll just pick up a couple of things that the member for Page said. I mean, in the last couple of months, there's been a, a slightly odd effort by those opposite, some of whom know the, the process around these things uh, well enough to realise that the, the effort they've been engaged in is faintly ridiculous. The effort has been to somehow suggest that the current government uh, isn't moving quickly enough to to see the ratification of these agreements. And of course, that's just rubbish. I mean, we, we have in, in this country and in this parliament um, a, a committee process that helps give us the highest quality agreement making that the Australian community can expect. And it does involve the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. And that, that committee, which I, which I chair, Deputy Speaker, expedited the consideration of, of these agreements and has ensured that the reports have been tabled in order for the legislation to come before the parliament and, uh, and for the agreements to be ratified. So the idea that there somehow has, has been anything less than um, focused, timely action by the Albanese Labor government is just um, a, a made up fairy tale uh, perpetrated, prosecuted by those opposite. In any case, both of these agreements are especially timely. They're especially timely at a point where Australia needs to enable trade diversification as much as trade growth. And the effective ratification of the agreements before the end of the year will mean that uh, Australian exporting businesses get two closely successive tariff cuts. The first will apply on entry into force and the second will occur on the 1st of January next year. That double tariff cut, needless to say, should be a welcome end of year prospect for uh, Australian export businesses. They have faced choppy economic waters in the wake of the pandemic and uh, unfortunately, in the aftermath of China's geo-economic coercion. For a range of sectors around this nation, the double tariff cut will provide uh, either an immediate boost or the prospect in, in short order of opening up new opportunities as we head into 2023 and beyond. Um, in addition to the benefit of tariff reductions and increased tariff-free quotas in some areas, the India and UK agreements serve to diversify and deepen Australia's set of trading relationships. Deputy Speaker, there's no doubt that within our Indo-Pacific region, India represents an absolutely critical international partnership for Australia for lots of reasons, uh, with a huge potential to be realised between our two nations in the decade to come. Uh, it's, it's worth noting that for India, this agreement is the country's first free trade agreement with a major developed uh, country in over 10 years. That goes to show how significant it is for India and how precious uh, this kind of agreement is. It, it, it shows you the extent to which it is a long sought after and hard won achievement. The negotiations on which uh, it is based began back in 2011, more than a decade ago. It's been and it has been the commendable work, and it has been the commendable work of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and ministers on both sides, on both sides over many years, which have led us here today. I, I would like to acknowledge, putting putting the silly putting the silly partisan games aside, I would like to acknowledge the work of the member for Wannan, the former Minister for Trade, who signed this agreement. He signed it 
in April this year, and indeed he signed the UK agreement. He signed that agreement virtually in 2021 in the circumstance of the pandemic. And I'm sure that the, the member for Wannan, the member for Page, if he had his time again, and other people will stand up and, and note that the, the negotiations began under the former Labor government back in 2011. They're being delivered, of course, by this Labor government. I don't remember that being mentioned, but I'm sure from this point on that will be mentioned. Yeah. So this agreement eliminates tariffs on over 90 per cent of Australian goods exports by value to India, and it does provide new opportunities for Australian services companies and professionals who seek to access the Indian market. It's already shown the way towards a more ambitious agreement between Australia and India in the form of the Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement, which we hope will continue to advance towards completion. This agreement, very, very significant, the first that India has settled with a developed nation inside of 10 years, something we've worked on for more than 11 years. Very, very significant, but it is nevertheless a, a, what's regarded as a, a, an early harvest agreement, a stepping stone towards that full agreement, which um, we look forward to, certainly Australian businesses look forward to. There's no question that India is embarking on a new approach, approach that does involve greater trade ambition. It has set its sights on free trade agreements with the UK, the EU and Canada among others. Crucially though, this agreement ensures that Australia will not be excluded or left behind from any improved trade and market access that might follow from uh, new agreements that India negotiates and sells in future. This, this agreement will open up more opportunities for trade services and people-to-people -people connections uh, for us here. Deputy Speaker, the Labor government has been clear uh, in, in its first six months of operation, six months today, that building our relationship with India is a top priority. Next year, the Prime Minister will visit India twice to build closer economic ties and take part in the G20, which will be hosted by India. Our positive security partnership will also develop when Prime Minister Modi visits Australia for the Quad Partnership Meeting in 2023. Deputy Speaker, steps like the AIECTA, uh, which is the um, slightly awkward acronym we're giving to this agreement, the AI ECTA, will contribute to bridging gaps between our two nations as trading partners, but also more broadly as, as communities within the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I can say that as a West Australian, I'm really glad to represent a state that feels a natural connection to the Indian Ocean Rim, and it's important uh, that we recognise the significance and enormous potential of our cultural, diplomatic, defence and trade relationships with not just India, but also Indonesia. Uh, on the current trajectory, it's, it's likely that by 2045, India and Indonesia will be the third and fourth ranked global economies, respectively. Uh, and while we, we understandably talk a lot about the, the significance, the economic significance of China as our largest trading partner, I think we, we sometimes forget the significance or we, uh, we undervalue and underemphasize the significance of both India, India and Indonesia. The reality is we've only just begun to explore the trade and investment opportunities between Australia and both of these critical Indo-Pacific partners. Um, just to take an example, the export of wine. I mean, we, we had a, a wine export to India that was in the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, which of course, unfortunately, has been uh, affected by the approach that China has chosen to take, a, a self-limiting and self-harming approach from the point of view of their consumers, but obviously a harmful approach from the point of view of Australian wine exporters. At the moment, total wine exports to India only total 20 million. So 20 million to India as compared to um, more than 500 million um, to China. Uh, that's why ensuring that we, we do even better than, than the, the agreement negotiated uh, by the previous government with respect to wine is so important because frankly, um, you know, wine exporters in this country will tell you that it hasn't really opened the door for them in the way that they would like, and that's a, that's a, a market of enormous potential. Um, I'm happy to say that India has been a, a shaping influence in my life. I, I did live in Maharashtra with my family for a year when I was eight. It was the first place I travelled uh, under my own steam when I was 20. Uh, Indian history or an aspect of Indian history was a focus of my master's work at the University of Melbourne. I was fortunate to be an AsiaLink scholar in New Delhi in 1999 and to visit again 20 years later in, in 2019 as the Deputy Chair of the Energy and Environment Committee. Uh, Indian migration is one of the strongest threads of new multicultural vibrancy in, in my electorate. There's no doubt about that. And I'm glad that the Western Australian um, Parliament, the McGowan Government, includes four members um, with uh, 
with Indian heritage. Kevin Michelle, Dr Jags Krishnan and Yasma Barakai, a, a very good friend of mine whose, whose seat falls within, partly within the uh, federal division of Fremantle. Um, but Deputy Speaker, uh, I want to turn briefly to the Australia-UK FTA and its enabling legislation. Uh, this agreement is Australia's most ambitious free trade agreement with any country other than New Zealand. It reflects the long-standing importance, quality and depth of the political, cultural and economic relationship between Australia and the UK while setting a framework for future trade and cooperation. Um, it comes at a significant time, obviously considering what's happened uh, between uh, the UK and the EU. It's provided us, as, as UK made, the decision um, to Brexit, if that's the appropriate verb. Uh, it's given us the opportunity to settle this deal. Um, and obviously we have the, uh, the trade agreement under negotiation between ourselves and the EU, which will also be very significant. Um, the bills before the House that we're debating here implement customs and tariff commitments made in both the trade agreements, uh, also critically the administrative rules, penalties, um, in respect to the export imports of goods and the agreed tariff rates. When, when this legislation passes, as I hope it will first uh, here and then in the other place, um, and the agreement enters into force, it will mean, as the member for Page observed, that 99% of Australian goods by value will be able to enter the UK duty-free. Uh, for farmers uh, and agricultural exporters to the UK, they will benefit in some areas, not in all areas, but in some areas, from a progressive reduction in tariff and barriers making our exports more competitive um, and the liberalisation uh, of, of, um, of access in a range of areas much, uh, much, much stronger, um, more attractive for Australian exporters. Um, beyond the, the welcome reduction of trade and investment barriers, there are a number of, of uh, other outcomes which I'll, which I'll indicate. Um, this agreement has a world first chapter dedicated to promoting innovation and an Australian first chapter uh, that looks to enhance women's access to the full benefits of trade and investment. These are features of what we call kind of WTO plus agreements. They go well past what was traditionally included in trade and investment agreements. Um, they include commitments on tackling modern slavery and also um, on labour standards, which are important. Um, uh, above all, Deputy Speaker, an element of this agreement which uh, shines through, I think, which is distinctive, are provisions in the agreement to advance Indigenous interests and open new opportunities for First Nations exporters. And that was certainly a focus of the conversation in the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. Uh, it's notable that the highest proportion of eligible resales of um, art, particularly First Nations art in the UK, um, have lacked the, the protection or the benefit of the kind of resale royalty arrangements that the previous Labor government put in place domestically here. And this agreement uh, puts us on the path to ensure that those reciprocal arrangements will be in place so that Australian artists um, benefit when their work is resold. Other provisions include commitments from the UK to recognise the importance of genetic resources, traditional knowledge and cultural expression. Um, these provisions are important for the agreement, but there's more work to be done. I, I welcome, I'm sure everyone here will welcome the fact that the Foreign Minister uh, has set out the Labor government's intention for there to be um, a specific First Nations foreign policy with a recruitment of an ambassador for First Nations people who will lead efforts to embed uh, indigenous perspectives, experiences and interests right across the full range of our um, external affairs engagements. Um, in closing, Deputy Speaker, these two agreements have been years in the making. They've been years in the making through patient determination by Australia and strong collaboration between Australia and our partners, both India and the UK. Um, they are the result of successful negotiations which have taken place over many years by hardworking officials uh, in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and by ministers, um, past, past and present, the member one here in the chamber. Um, their progress in negotiation through government, through parliament um, and the treaties committee, and now the enabling legislation in this place, uh, have enabled multi-partisan consideration, which is proper, and hopefully following this debate, the support in this house and support in, in the other place. As I noted earlier, it, the federal election in May caused a pause in the consideration of the agreements, one of which was only signed in April. 
Um, but it's been appropriate that the government actually sought for the agreements to be dealt with properly and expeditiously. Those two things, properly and expeditiously, through the JSCOT, through the treaty agreement. There have been some people suggesting that's not been the case. That's absolutely what's happened, and it means that Australia delivers on our commitments and signals to our partners that this government is serious and committed to seeking far-reaching, ambitious trade agreements. 